I get asked all the time, is there a time and a place for an internal focus? The answer is no. That's what the scientific data tells me. Show me data because I've looked for it and I can't find it. I think we should be looking for the rules rather than the exceptions to the rules. And I think if you look at the large body of work out there in motor learning, motor control research, when it comes to focus of attention, it is overwhelming that the scientific results tell us you want to focus externally. And I have yet to see really any sort of clear, compelling evidence that suggests that there's a time and a place for an internal focus. Sometimes you don't see a difference between internal and external, but you just don't see much evidence out there at all that there's a time where internal is better than external. Welcome to this episode of Coach Noah Talks, where I have the pleasure of speaking with Jared Porter, director of the Motor Behavior Lab at the University of Tennessee. His research investigates how humans learn and relearn motor skills and how we generate skillful movements. Our topic today is motor learning. I'm excited to have him on the show to share his insights and knowledge. I want to now switch gears and move over to attentional focus. So to start our conversation on this topic, can you talk about the differences between an internal focus and external focus and a holistic focus? I think we know quite a lot about the internal and external comparison. This is a, a topic that's been studied in depth since the late 1990s. And think about the terms internal, external focus. To me, in the most simple of terms, like an internal focus just simply means that the person is thinking about their body movements when they are executing a motor skill. An external focus means that they are thinking about the desired result of the movement when they are performing a motor skill. Some folks have also defined an external focus as thinking about like an object in the environment. Others have defined external focus just meaning that you're thinking about anything but the movement. I'm a bit of a purist when it comes to this. So for me, an external focus just means I'm thinking about the result of the movement versus the movement itself. So to bring this back to golf, if I'm swinging a golf club, I might think about my upper body rotation or the angle in which my elbow is when I'm swinging a golf club. Those are all internal directing cues because I'm thinking about the movements of my body when I'm executing the golf swing. In contrast, I could think about the movement of the golf club or the trajectory that I want the ball to follow when I hit it, those are all external directing cues because I'm now thinking about the desired result, which is moving the golf club through a certain range of motion or projecting the ball in a certain trajectory. I think holistic is something a little bit newer. I think generally a holistic focus of attention is defined as focusing on the feeling of a movement when you execute a task. There's been a few studies published on this that I'm aware of. One of the things I always come back to is when I think about a holistic focus as it's defined in the literature, it always sounds like a version of an external focus. So if I'm thinking about what a movement felt like, to me that begins to sound a lot like the outcome of a movement. The result of a movement is, is feeling a certain way. And I think generally speaking, the studies that have been published using a holistic focus have demonstrated that adopting a holistic focus is equal to an external focus when it comes to performance, or it's not as good as an external focus. And so as a researcher, I'm always looking for the rule rather than the exception to the rule. And so I think that when you look at the large, robust body of work that's been done on this topic, it's very overwhelming that getting people to direct their attention externally is, is far superior to getting people to direct their attention internally. And we'll see with time how a holistic focus falls in there. But so far, the results, I think, are demonstrating that a holistic focus is equal to an external focus or maybe not as good as an external focus. So those three terms, that's how we would define them based on the literature. And that's how I understand the general results, that body of work. And now diving into some of the specific papers, one I'm interested in was related to heart rate and it was titled heart rate is distinctly influenced by complexity of instructions and direction of attentional focus can you touch on that and explain what the findings are when we see the relationship between focus and heart rate so this was a study that we published pretty recently people came in and they just did a very simple balancing task so they just stood still and we shifted their attention either internally or externally while they were standing still and then we also measured heart rate. These are college students that are presumably fit. So for them to stand still, we wouldn't expect to see changes in heart rate. 
but we did. We found that when we directed these folks to focus on maintaining body stability, their heart rate increased. When we directed their attention externally, their heart rate decreased. And it was one of the first demonstrations to show that by altering somebody's consciousness, either internally or externally, you're directly affecting heart rate, the cardiovascular system, which is inherently tied to the cognitive system. And so that was interesting. I didn't really expect that, to be real honest with you. And I love as a scientist and I proved myself wrong because I know it's going to lead to future research and lots of new questions and that's stimulating in many ways. So that was a novel finding that we discovered is that just by shifting somebody's conscious or cognitive attention, you can affect heart rate. There have been other studies that have looked at physically demanding tasks like running or rowing, things that are more continuous in nature than have demonstrated by encouraging people to focus on their breathing or heart rate actually increases respiration and cardiac function. That's not good. So if you're an endurance athlete, your goal is to lower your respiration and heart rate. But ironically, by thinking about respiration or heart rate, you actually elevate your respiration or heart rate, which very likely causes you to fatigue faster, which is undesirable if you're an endurance athlete. So if you're a golfer out playing 18 holes and you're going to be out there for a few hours and you're in a high stressful situation, you want to find ways to lower your heart rate in your breathing to stay calm and stay focused. And so these types of data collectively demonstrate that you don't want people to be thinking about their heart rate and respiration if the goal is to lower those things. And we did another study recently that came out where we actually drew blood. So we had people on a treadmill running and shifted their focus of attention while they were running and then drew blood and looked at blood lactate levels. And the results there showed that when you got people to focus more externally while they're running, it changed their blood chemistry. Blood lactate levels dropped. So again, we're shifting cognition and it's affecting blood chemistry. And so again, if you're an endurance athlete or if you're doing something that's potentially fatiguing, you want to try to keep your blood lactate levels lower so it doesn't cause a fatiguing phenomenon. And so we're starting to see more clear evidence of these kind of mind-body connections, if you will, by shifting attentional awareness we can begin not only affect movement accuracy, but things like heart rate, respiration, and blood composition. Now, let's touch a bit on imagery. There's one paper, the effects of using imagery to elicit an external focus of attention. How does imagery play into that? That study in particular is one that we did look at more of a logistical problem, which is sometimes when you're practicing, there's not a very explicit or clear way to direct your attention externally. So we thought, gosh, maybe we can use imagery to do that. So if you imagine some sort of external target in the environment that's not physically there, can you get the same benefits in comparison to directing your attention towards a physical target? Turns out you can. You can use imagery to prompt an external focus. And our data suggests that it's just as effective as directing your attention to something in the environment. So in this particular study, just to make it more concrete, we had people do a standing long jump. And so in one condition, participants were told to focus on jumping towards a cone that was out in front of them. So there was a physical cone that was located like five meters in front of them, I think was the distance, maybe three meters. So they're just jumping towards that target. Then in the imagery condition, there was no cone, but we told them just imagine that there's a cone out there in front of you. So see it in your mind's eye and now jump to that target. And we found that prompting those folks to jump towards an imaginary cone was just as effective as telling them to jump towards a physical cone in the environment. And so I know others have then replicated that finding by doing other types of tasks, by using imagery to create these environmental cues that you can direct your attention towards. So again, that's all very encouraging. If you have a good imagination, you can create a lot of very effective things to direct your attention towards. So like in golf, if you can't see where the flag is, maybe there's a hill or a tree obstructing your view, but you can imagine where that target is, that's where you want to shift your attention towards. So even though you can't physically see it, you can create a mental picture or image of what the target is. And these types of findings suggest that's just as effective as being able to actually see the target. I think that's an important implication. In golf especially, we hear that imagery is very important. 
and it emphasizes even if there's nothing there in the environment if you can create that in your mind's eye that can have real measurable impact on performance yeah 100 percent. one that i think is very important a paper from a coaching perspective was titled focus of attention and verbal instruction strategies of elite track and field coaches and athletes and i thought this was very interesting and important because it highlighted the gap in between where the science is and where coaching instruction is, even at a very high level. Yeah, these types of papers are always disheartening as a researcher to report, but they are valuable because it does show this big disconnect. So in this particular paper, we went out and surveyed a bunch of uh, USA track and field athletes. This was an Olympic year where we collected these data. We went out and this is when I was doing some work with the USA track and field in preparation for the Olympic games. And so we went out and surveyed a bunch of athletes across a whole different host of events, just trying to understand what type of instructions does your coach give you? What type of feedback does your coach give you? And the data showed very clearly that at a very high percentage, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but a very high percentage, the athletes were being instructed to direct their attention internally in practice. And then that also then translated for when they were at the Olympic trials, which is where we surveyed them. When we asked, what do you focus on when you compete? They were reporting internal cues. So they're being instructed during practice to focus internally. And as a result, when they went to compete, they were directing their attention internally, which is not consistent with the scientific literature. And others have showed that as well. There's been a couple studies that have come from like physical therapy and athletic training showing similar effects that these practitioners tend to use cues at a very high rate that promote an internal focus rather than an external focus. So then not surprisingly, that relates to the learner in a way that then prompts them to focus internally rather than externally when they themselves are executing motor skills. I don't want to place the blame solely on the coaches here. I think this is where I think the scientific community must do a better job of getting this work into the hands of the practitioner. This is where I think my scientific discipline has failed. Coaches need to seek the knowledge themselves, but the scientists also need to get this into the hands of the coaches. And so I think we can hopefully work together to meet in the middle. So I think we all have the goal of optimizing human performance. And so that's what the scientists want. That's what the coach wants. That's what the athlete wants. And so we've got to come together to solve those problems. And so I'm hopeful that we can get better at doing that in the future. And before we go into some practical implications, there's one more paper that I think is really important to touch on. I thought was interesting. No fans, no problem. An investigation of audience effects on shooting performance in professional basketball. I think for me, when reading that was very interesting, I thought about how it relates to golf performance on the range versus on the course, small tournament versus big tournament. So can you talk about what was found? So this all kind of came about during COVID. So my research lab was shut down for 18 months because of COVID. So the university kind of stopped all human subject research. And I and the students working in the lab needed to find creative ways to flex our research muscles during that period of time. And I had read an article somewhere, and I forget where it was, but these sport journalists just noted, it seems like during COVID in the NBA, when they were all playing in the bubble in, I think, Orlando, so there was an NBA season where all the teams that participated in the season went to Orlando and played against each other in a kind of a sterile environment with no fans. And so you could watch on television these games, but these sport commentators said, boy, it seems like shot accuracy has increased in this bubble. And we thought, that's a testable question. And so we went out, collected some data that was publicly available from the NBA looking at shot accuracy. And what we discovered was that during the NBA season, when there were no fans present for the games, there was a very significant increase in free throw shooting accuracy. And we thought, wow, okay, that's interesting. And so we went back to the archives of the NBA and found that for decades, the free throw shooting percentage hadn't changed. It, and I forget the exact number. I want to say it had been like 72% for decades. It had been rock solid. But during the COVID season, Free throw shooting accuracy went up to 78% or something like that. It was significant. But nothing changed about shooting free throws. It's still the same regulation distance, the same regulation sized ball, the same regulation height of the hoop. The hoop was the same size. The constraints hadn't really changed about the actual game. 
And so now the only thing that has changed is no fans. These are empty stadiums where these games are being played other than the teammates that are on the bench and the coaching staff and very limited support staff. And we published this paper. It seems like if there's no fans, these professional basketball players immediately got better at shooting free throws. And I'll just also add that we have a paper that'll be coming out soon as a follow-up. Now that the NBA is back in full swing, has free throw shooting accuracy gone back to baseline? Turns out it has. That the COVID season was an anomaly. That the free throw shooting accuracy has gone back to a 30-year average in the NBA now that these players are back in arenas with fans. And so we rewrote this fun little paper talking through what could cause this. And it seems like when you look at the big picture, really two factors are at play here. One, there's no fans. And the other thing we considered is these players aren't traveling. They're all in Orlando. And so there's no home field advantage, if you will, because they're all together. There's no fans. But we did an analysis where we looked at previous NBA seasons and found when it came to shooting free throws, there really was no such thing as a home field advantage. It's a myth. If anything, actually, we found that shooting free throw accuracy at home games was worse than on road games. I don't think it was significant, but there was definitely a trend there. But overall, we did see this effect of, for whatever reason, without having fans present, it seems like these players were able to shoot more accurately. And it's got to be something related to attention, presumably, but we don't know. But I think it is relevant to things like golf, where they're practicing in isolation but then when you go to compete there are fans that are present hopefully they're quiet to a degree but just having fans present does create pressure and from a golf perspective even playing by yourself versus playing in a group with other people watching you observing you throughout the rounds so that's also an interesting element if you're constantly playing golf by yourself and then you suddenly have this other social dynamic and i think that brings up kind of the issues of practice specificity of what it comes to practical application like you want to try to practice in a way that best resembles competition environment and that's a perfect segue into the last section on practical implications for any golfers and coaches how can they improve their practice i think it's incredibly important from a sky acquisition point of view to create practice environments that best reflect testing or competition environments i always like to phrase this or think about it in terms of reverse engineering so look at what the competition environment is going to look like then from there, reverse engineer to try to create practice situations or practice environments that best resemble that testing environment. So if you're a golfer, play golf and really try to get away from gimmicks or drills or activities that don't really reflect playing the game of golf. If you want to get better as a golfer, go play golf and don't move away from that. And if you're a coach, that's working with a golfer, try to coach them in a way that reflects what the constraints are going to be like during a competition. So don't always be in their ear whispering to them what they should be doing or thinking about if you're not going to be able to do that during a competition. And I think from both a coach and an athlete's point of view, you want to try to create practice environments that are as close as possible to competition environments. And I think that's true for beginners and advanced golfers. I think all the scientific evidence out there keeps coming back to this basic fundamental principle that you want to create these practice environments that best resemble the t competition or testing environments. When you do that, you get more positive transfer of learning. It's just better. And the more you move away from that, the worse it is. From a focus perspective, generally external focus is advisable. When I'm in the competition or I'm on the golf course, I want to have an external focus. Yes, 100%. And I'll say something that's probably controversial. This has gotten me some hate mail before, but I'm going to say it. I get asked all the time, is there a time and a place for an internal focus? The answer is no. And I think that's what the scientific data tells me. And this is where I'll go back to something I said earlier in our conversation is that I think we should be looking for the rules rather than the exceptions to the rules. And I think if you look at the large body of work out there in motor learning, motor control research, when it comes to focus of attention, it is overwhelming that the scientific results tell us you want to focus externally. And I have yet to see really any sort of clear, compelling evidence that suggests that there's a time and a place for an internal focus. Sometimes you don't see a difference between internal and external, but you just don't see much evidence out there at all that there's a time where internal is better than external. 
And I equate this to if a hundred people take a cyanide pill and 99 of them die and one doesn't, I'm not going to look at that one that didn't die and say, there's a time and a place to take a cyanide pill. And I think when you look at the focus of attention studies, hundreds of papers have been published and hundreds have demonstrated very clearly that no matter what you're doing, you want people to focus externally. So I'm just going to throw it out there. I get asked all the time by coaches in particular, isn't there a time and a place for an internal cue? No, show me data, show me data. Cause I've looked for it and I can't find it. And two points I'd love to get your thoughts on related to that is specifically for golf, because you're saying you want to replicate that environment. Mm -hmm. And that's the difficulty with golf is the range is not like the environment at all. So really ideal world, you should spend all your time on a golf course. Now there's logistical challenges in making that actual reality, but mm -hmm. it's safe to say that most people spend most of their time not on a golf course. Also from a competition perspective, my mindset that I want to encourage athletes or players to think of is that. If you're playing a competition and you don't play well, that's still part of your practice because you were in the real environment rather than thinking of sure. the range as your practice. No, if you played bad that round or you had a bad six holes, this is still part of your practice because this is the environment. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And then also secondly, your thoughts on, I find it interesting in golf practice rounds and people play practice rounds, they'll hit three balls, putt here and there, what I've reflected on is if you get the chance to play two, rounds before a competition, maybe one, you're really getting to know the course, but then play your ball and just treat that practice round. I get one ball. Oh, I hit an OB. Okay. I'm reteeing and I'm keeping score. Cause I think that's also bringing it back to what you said. What are the criteria? What is the actual scenario of a competition and bringing it closer to that? What are your thoughts on those two points? On the latter point, play the round, play golf. When you're actually playing golf, there's no do overs. There's no, oh, let's try that one again, or oh, I don't like where this ball is laying. No, you got to play it. So I think when you're doing a kind of a warm up round or a familiarization round, whatever you want to call it, yeah, play the round and try to learn from it and maybe spend a bit more time thinking about tactics and strategy in those rounds versus when you actually get in the competition and maybe think about some of these other factors that you might want to consider before you get into the actual tournament. I tend to be a bit of a minimalist with all this stuff. Yeah, I think when you start to make things more complicated, you're probably on the wrong track. I don't know if you're familiar with the principle of Occam's razor. I was just talking about this mm. with my graduate students the other day. Just the most simple, straightforward solution is generally going to be the right one. And so whenever you start to make things more complicated, you're probably on the wrong path. And I think golf in its purest form is a very simple game. Trying to take a club, hit a round ball into a small round hole, period. And if you can hit the ball straight every time, you're better than most. Simplify it. Break it down to its basic components and play the game. The more you can play the game, as close to competition, the better. And I forgot the first question you'd asked me. The first part was more just in general about the disconnect of how much time is spent on the golf course versus the oh, range. Yeah. And if we're thinking about the golf course being the environment in which we perform, that's the challenge of golf compared to other sports is that most people spend most of their time in the environment that's not even close to what they're actually playing. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It's expensive. You might not live close to a golf course, but they're almost like different activities. Yeah, I think that there are data that do show that a lot of times if you're on the range, a lot of those skills that you develop there don't transfer to the course. So yeah, as much as you can, be on the course. I mean, play the game. Even if you're on the range, try to make it game-like. So that means change your club every swing, you know, or hit to new targets versus just getting a bucket of balls and grabbing your seven iron and just whacking 47 iron shots as far as you can. You're never going to do that when you play golf. That would be a contextual interference issue. And so if you just grab one club, hit a bunch of balls in a row, that would be more block practice, which is low contextual interference. So yeah, you might do great on the range, but that is not going to transfer well to playing the round of golf. And so even if you're on the range, switching your club every time creates higher contextual interference, which is better than lower contextual interference. And that's going to give you a little bit more transfer to the round of golf, but you still want to try to spend as much time playing the game as you can or doing things that replicate the game as much as you can. It's not always possible, but get as close as you can. There was one point you mentioned earlier, there is some support for if you're structuring your session at the beginning, having a bit of block if you're a beginner to familiarize yourself with the movements that you're doing and then move away into more higher contextual interference practice. 
That's right. If you look at all the contextual interference stuff, the thing that we can absolutely say without any reservation is that strictly block practice should be avoided at all cost. There is no evidence to suggest that strictly block practice is good for long-term learning. So you might do a little bit of block practice initially, but then get away from it. Introduce more contextual interference, make it more randomized. You just don't want to do strictly block practice. If your goal is to improve long-term performance, if that's not your goal, then do whatever you want. Can you share current research projects, things that you're interested in at the moment? I'm so fortunate to get to work with a bunch of great students that are incredibly intelligent and come up with great ideas. And so a bunch of the students that are working in the lab right now are extending some of our earlier findings as it relates to things like virtual reality and augmented reality and these emerging technologies. We're doing a bunch of studies right now extending upon these findings that I talked about a little bit earlier in our conversation. So we're looking at kind of the level of fidelity, like how much detail do you need in this VR platform for it to be beneficial? What about extended practice? And how does this begin to change these psychological things? And so we're doing a bunch of stuff across a whole host of activities, examining how can this technology be utilized more effectively to enhance motor learning and performance. And then we're also doing a lot of work with medical populations, military populations, some industry partners, Again, we're not just looking at sport. We're looking at trying to understand across the human experience, how can these types of technologies be used? We're also doing some more focus of attention work where we're trying to understand some of these constraints as they might relate to how to optimize performance through focus of attention. And then we're doing some contextual interference work as well and getting into some fun things related to artificial intelligence and how we can use AI platforms as a supplement to practice, I had a really fun conversation yesterday with the students about chat GPT and all these okay. things that are really popular right now about how can we use, how can we embrace these technologies? Let's not be afraid of them or let's not run away from them. They're not going away. What are your initial thoughts or what was the discussion regarding leveraging chat GPT? What was the context of that? It was a meandering conversation with the students because we got into a whole host of different topics. I and mean, where to start is because midterms are coming up. And so just for fun, this is for a graduate motor learning class. I took my midterm questions and put them into chat GPT and boy, did it give me great answers. And so I thought, oh, wow, that's really interesting. So I was like, let's talk about this because I'm not naive enough to think that the grad students aren't going to do this. No, they should be using these resources to help them fish for information and things like that. So I think one of the things I might do as an alternative is give the students in the class an answer that chat GPT gave me. And then ask them, tell me what's right and wrong about that. And so instead of testing their knowledge of getting them to respond to the question, actually have them evaluate the AI platform and then see, can they identify from their wisdom based upon the scientific evidence that we know exists as humans, is this AI able to be correct? And how is it correct or how is it incorrect? Because I think as a practitioner, that's incredibly important. So if you're a golf coach, and you go ask chat GPT or any other AI platform, like what are some good drills or activities I should be having my players do? And it spits out an answer, which it will. It's then your job as the human, as the expert to understand, is this right or wrong? Is this valid information? And we had a really fun, engaged conversation just about that. And then also getting to the ethics of it. The idea that, you know, if we as scientists or as practitioners or just humans are relying on this information, what are the ethics around that? If it's giving a unique response, you know, it's, you're not stealing another human's work because it's not a human giving you that. So just the ethics of, is that unethical to take an answer that an AI platform gave you? I don't have an answer to that. I don't know. Yeah. But these are the things that we're all going to have to deal with. We need to have those conversations, but let's figure out ways to utilize the technology versus not. Because it's not going to go away. It's going to get better. And so I'm always skeptical of these things, as I mentioned earlier. But we're thinking about ways in which we can do peer learning with AI. So can AI become a practice partner? So if you don't have a teammate, when you're trying to work through a problem, I think as I play with the technology, it's pretty good. And the answers it's giving me, as somebody who's researched these things for years, it would have taken me quite a bit of effort to come up with an answer as good as the AI gave me in a few seconds. And there's part of that's really exciting. There's part of that's terrifying. There's part of that is confusing. There's part of that is 
celebratory. It's like there's all these mixed emotions. I don't know how I feel about it, but it's here. And I think we better learn to embrace it and utilize it effectively. I think these types of technology can really help us solve some problems or create problems. I'm excited about the future just in ways of us thinking about how can we lean into this stuff versus away from it. To conclude this episode, any book recommendations that you'd like to share? The works of Robert Greene have been pretty impactful on me, and in particular related to this conversation, he has a book called Mastery. Robert Greene, he's a writer and a journalist by training, but he's written on a whole host of topics, just all related to human behavior. And I've really valued his point of view. He oftentimes gives a very historical perspective, which I kind of like. And it's really helped me think and reflect just about my own work and my own self. And as a recommendation, I think Robert Greene's book on mastery had been pretty impactful. Another book that I read years ago that I always come back to is Team of Rivals. And I forget who wrote it, but it's a book about Abraham Lincoln, but another historical perspective. And as the title implies, the crux of the book is when Abraham Lincoln was elected president, he was very aware that he had a series of very difficult decisions that he was going to have to make as a young president. He knew the Civil War was coming. He knew that there was a country that was deeply divided on a whole host of topics. And as a tactic, what he decided to do is to take all of his political rivals and make them his cabinet members. And so he surrounded himself by his critics and by his worst enemies, because he thought, if I've got to work through complex questions to come up with effective solutions, I don't want people in the room that are just going to agree with me. I want people in the room to be critics and point out how I'm flawed. And boy, is there a lot of wisdom to learn from that approach. I think it's very easy as a human to just surround yourself with people that just agree with you and we don't evolve. So that's a book and an idea that I think about quite often on more of a personal level. I've really enjoyed the books written by Nick Offerman, the actor and comedian from Parks and Rec, where a lot of people know Nick Offerman. He's written a whole bunch of books. I, as an amateur woodworker myself, I enjoy just creating things with my hands. I do gardening and things like that. Nick Offerman has written quite a few books in a style that I really enjoy, just about handcrafting. And so he's written Where the Deer and Antelope Play is a recent book about just his travels around the country. And he's got a book out there about woodworking called Good Clean Fun, which is pretty great. And he's, he's a comedian and a philosopher. At least I would consider him a philosopher, so I just enjoy his style of writing. And then on that same vein, there's another book that I've enjoyed called Forge and Carve, which is a book that just, it's profiling a bunch of different crafters, all the way from blacksmithing to leatherworking to wood carving to you name it. And so I find a lot of inspiration in looking at people that are very good at their craft and not just within sport or human movement, but people that have excelled. And so I find it pretty inspirational just to look across different human experiences and thinking about diverse ideas and points of view. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about that a little bit. Dr. Porter, I really appreciate your time today. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and wisdom, and I respect your skepticism of technology, but the fact that you're not avoiding it and that you're engaging with it and trying to figure out how it can be used. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. And again, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. It's been an absolute treat. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Coach Noah Talks. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the Golf Performance Newsletter. This is where I share written audio and video content designed to help golfers take their game to the next level. All the relevant links from today's episode into the newsletter can be found in the description.